Okay, so that'd be one over cosine, which we know in our heads is really just that we're going to flip it. What about cotan? So if tangent is sine over cosine, what would cotan be? Cosine. Nice. Okay, or you could think of it as one over tan, if you want. It really doesn't matter. They're the same thing. So as um, we said earlier, recall that dividing by a fraction means you're going to multiply that by the reciprocal or you're just going to flip the value. So let's look at our first row. Okay, remember in hand trig that your, your fingers are zero. What comes next? Pi six, pi fourths, pi thirds, pi halves. Sign is top or bottom? bottom because sin goes hmm, you know where and then cosine is on top yeah remember the formula I'm going to squeeze it up here is the square root of the fingers over two so what if you have no fingers zero and what if you have all four fingers what does it come out to be one because remember it'd be two over two which is one yeah okay so let's do the first one Cosecant pi six. That would be one over sine pi sixth. Yeah? So find sine pi six for me. We did this yesterday. Don't say it out loud, just think about it. Which one is pi six? Sine's on the bottom. Okay, now tell me what it is. It'd be square root of one over two, but what's the square root of one? So it's one over two, yeah? And then flip it. Now, could you put 2 over 1? Sure. Okay, so this would be 1 divided by a half, but then we'd be flipping the half. That's how it comes out to be 2. Are we all good with that on the same page? Okay, next one. Secant pi 6. Whose partner is secant? 1 over cosine. So we're going to find the cosine of pi 6, and then we're going to divide it under 1. So think about that for a second. We already found the pi sixth finger. It was this one, right? But cosine are my top guys. How many are there? Root three over two, flip it. Okay, and then remember, we're not worried about getting the square root off the bottom. We're just gonna leave it for now, okay? All right, next one. Secant five pi six. My reference angle is pi six, so it's still gonna be two over root three. The only thing I have to check is what quadrant we're in. So let's review how to do that from yesterday. This is six out of six. Where would five pi out of six be? I wouldn't make it all the way to here. I'd only go to five, so that would put me there, right? Which letter is in that quadrant? S. Sine is positive. What does that mean cosine is? And so if I flip something negative, it would stay negative. So I'm going to put a little star here and put because cosine is negative. And so when you divide something by 1, it won't change the sign. If it started negative, it'll stay negative, yeah? Okay, we're going to skip cotan for now just to kind of get the basics here. So next one is pi fourths. Who is cosecant's partner? Sine. So I'd like for you to please, in your head, find the sine of pi fourths. And then in your mind, remember, you're going to have to flip it before you put it on your paper. Okay, what's the sine of pi fourths? Pi f oh, pi halves. It would have been one. Pi fourths is this guy, though, yeah? How many? Two over two. Oh, crap. What did I forget to do? So it should be 2 over root 2. Yeah, because we're flipping it. Now, remember that for your pi fourths finger, that's your middle finger. The number of fingers on top and on bottom are the same. So if sine is root 2 over 2, what's cosine as well? Root 2 over 2. But I have to remember to do what? Flip it. So it would be 2 over root 2. Okay, now let's do cosecant 5 pi fourths. Now remember... If the cosecant of pi fourths is 2 over root 2, 5 pi fourths will have the same number part. 
The only question will be whether you're going to put a plus or a minus on it. So I'm going to steal this 2 over root 2, but now we have to consider what quadrant we're in. So draw this guy for me. This is 4 pi out of 4. And I want you to think about where 5 pi fourths puts you. All students take calculus. Which letter are you going to be in at 5 pi fourths? T. Very good. 5 pi fourths, that's 4. And then 5 would be a little bit more. So that would put us in the T quadrant. If cosecant is sine's partner, what is sine's value? Negative, which means when I flip it, it would stay negative. So make sure you put a little negative on that one. Okay? All right, next row. We're doing pi thirds. Find your pi thirds finger. That would be which one? Pointer. I'm doing cosecant first. Whose partner is that? Sine, which is top or bottom? Bottom. How many are there? <laughs> Three over two, but then I have to flip it. 2 over square root 3. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing but for 2 pi thirds. So go back to your pi thirds finger. Who is secant's partner? Where's cosine, top or bottom? Cosine's on top. How many on top? So should I put 1 half? 2 over 1. Good. Because why? We flipped it. Yeah, we took the reciprocal. Okay, from there i got to consider what quadrant I'm in. So, Set it up. This is 3 pi out of 3. Because remember, it's like one whole pi. So if I only have 2 thirds of a pi, think about what quadrant you're in. S, S, good. 2 pi thirds would have been here. And so that gives me S is positive, but who's secant's partner? Cosine. cosine, which means cosine would have been negative. negative, which means when I flip it, it's negative 2. Make sense? Okay, uh, last two, tangent is going to be sine 0 over cosine 0. What will cotangent be? Good, cosine 0 over sine 0. So remember, the only difference is that they're flipped. Now let's find them. Which finger corresponds to 0 degrees? Pinky, the one I can't bend. Okay, and then uh, sine's on bottom. How many on bottom? zero. And if all four guys are on top, what is that going to simplify to? One. One. And if you're not sure, remember it's square root four over two, which is two divided by two, which is one. Okay, is it okay to have zero divided by one? Yes. yes. What do you get? Zero. zero. What about if you have one divided by zero on the next one? Undefined. Undefined. Very good. Okay, and most of y'all uh, remember that pretty easily, but you can think about it's okay to get zero on the top. No, you can't get zero on the bottom. Get it? Okay. <laughs> uh, negative angle. What does that change? Yes, it changes the direction. So you're going to put that right here. Okay, a negative angle indicates the direction that you measure it. So instead of going up and over, you're going to measure down. So everything else is the same, but what quadrant you're in is going to, how you determine that is going to be the opposite. So let's do this first one. Find for me, using your hand trig, the sine of pi thirds. Don't say it out loud. Just think about it. Pi thirds, which finger you're on, we're not flipping anything. Normal sine of pi thirds, what would it be? Okay, root 3 over 2. And then because it's a negative pi thirds, I'm going to have to rotate down first. So here's my all students take calculus. I'm going down pi thirds. That puts me right here. Cosine is positive. What does that make sine? Negative. Good job. Um, try those next three.
Which two are you going to be flipping? 14 and 16. Oh, 16, I meant for that to be negative. We put a negative. Sorry if you already did it. We get negative 7 pi 6. Sorry, that was like the whole point of the section. So squeeze a negative in right there. Okay, let's do 15 first. So we're doing this one right here. What is the cosine of normal pi fourths? Square root of 2 over 2. What quadrant, if I do negative pi fourths, am I going to end up in? Fourth, which is the letter C. So for cosine, it's going to stay positive. You don't have to write the positive, but I'm putting it just to show we thought about it. Okay, next one. Cosecant, who's his partner? Sine, what's our reference angle? Pi what? Thirds. Pi thirds, that's this guy. Sine's on bottom, so it's root 3 over 2. Is that what I put on my paper? No, two, over. 2 over root 3, because why it's flipped. Okay, then on top of that, I have to consider my angle. So if this is 3 pi thirds, and I want to go negative 2 pi thirds, what letter does that put you in? A, S. T, C. Which one? T. T is correct. You'd go all the way to 2 pi thirds and then you'd stop. So if that's my tangent positive, what does that make sign when I flip it? Negative. Negative. Good. Okay, last one. Cosine of pi 6. Pi 6 is which one? Ring finger, yeah? So then cosine would be on top. How many? 3, three over 2, but I have to flip it. So 2 over root 3. This time I want to go negative 7 pi over 6. That's 6 out of 6. Well, but I'm going, we, put, we added the negative. Uh -huh. So you'd go all the way 6 out of 6 and then go a 7th. And that would put you right here. So that's our all students. That's our sine quadrant is positive. What does that make cosine? So when I flip a negative, it's going to stay negative. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So all of that pretty much is pre-cal. We're going to do it all year. It's just easier to kind of go over at the beginning before we get into all the trig stuff. So our main thing today is going to be limits, which are going to be way easier than trig and the unit circle and all of that, hopefully. So go ahead and switch to your notes for me, please. challenging really part of today is going to be all of the notation that's going to be thrown at you, but we're going to be doing this notation for weeks. So the first day it's going to be kind of weird, but then it'll get better. So you're going to write the limit, L-I-M, L-I-M, that stands for limit, as X approaches C. So that's X and then a little arrow C. And then you're going to put as a superscript a little minus. Then you're going to put f of x equals l. We're going to break it down in just a second, but for right now, I'm just going to have you write it. Now I'd like for you to write the exact same thing on the other side, but instead of a little minus, I want you to put a little plus sign. Okay? So it's going to be lim, x arrow c with a little plus, and then f of x equals l. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to give you the definition of this side, and then the other side we're just going to change one word. So, as x approaches x equals c from the left, Okay, then I want you to underline the word left. And the other side is exactly the same thing, except instead of left, it's going to be right. So I'm just going to put from the right side. If you would like to go back and rewrite the whole thing, you can, but that's the only word that would be different. Okay, so this is not hard, so some of y'all are going to want to overthink it. Don't overthink it. As you are tracing the graph towards a specific x value, you're going to be looking for what your y values are getting closer to. So the first number we're going to do this for is 1. Do you see these two right here? Where x is approaching 1 with a negative, and then x is approaching 1 with a positive. So on your graph, I want you to draw a little dotted line at 1. Okay, if you were only looking at the left side of this graph, so I'm going to cover the other side. Pretend it's not there. What does it look like as I trace this graph towards 1, my y value is getting closer to? As I'm approaching that dotted line we just drew, what does it look like our y value is getting closer to? One, One is correct. Okay, now I'm going to move my little notepad thing to the other side. We're only going to look at the right side. If I was only looking at that side of the graph, two is, or the actual line is gone, but you're just looking at that line drawn flat across, what would you guess the value would be at one? What height? Uh, yeah, three. So as I trace the graph from the left side, I'm approaching 1. As I trace from the right side, I'm approaching 3. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing for 2. So I'm going to draw a different line over here at 2. I'm going to cover up one side of the graph. As I approach 2 from the left side, my graph is flat across. What would you guess the next dot would be at? What height? still three. Okay, let's shift it over. What about if we were only looking at that part of the graph? What would you guess the next height would be? Two. two. Very good. So it's three from the left, but it's two from the right. Okay, last one. Let's look at three. So draw your little dotted line in there. Cover up the left or the right side of the graph. We're only looking at the left side. What would you guess the height would be at three? Three. What would you guess covering the other side that the height would be? Three. So sometimes they're the same. Sometimes they're different. Yeah. Okay. So those are one-sided limits. That means that you're only looking at half of the graph at a time. Okay. You have a definite limit which is only going to exist if those two things match. So write down here for me the limit as x approaches c, no plus or minus. For f of x equals l if the limit with the negative is equal to the limit with the positive. So if your left and your right limits come out the same, then you would say that you can take that plus or minus off and say that that's the definite limit instead of only looking at one side of the graph at a time. Okay? So out of the three limits we just looked at, 
X approaching 1, X approaching 2, and X approaching 3. Which one is going to exist out of those three choices? X approaching 3. So come down here, number 11, and I want you to put it equals 3. Why? Because the left and the right sides matched. Okay? Now, what about X approaching 2? Did those match? No. The notation for that would be you'd put D and E. Yeah, what, how do you, do you know that for Mean Girls? Yeah, at the end where she's in like the map and then she's like, oh, the limit doesn't exist, see? It's a real thing. Doesn't exist, okay? And the reason why is because the L and the R's are different. The left and the right limits aren't the same. Okay, uh, what about X approaching 1? That one also did not exist, so I'm going to put D and E on that one as well. Okay, let's go back to number 7 and 8. Put a dotted line at negative 2. Hide each of the sides of the graphs one at a time and see if it looks the same. So as I approach negative 2 from the left and the right, what does it appear like the left side is approaching? 4. What about the right side? 4. So then does the limit exist as we approach that number? Yeah, it's 4. And it's 4 from both sides. That's the only way it works. Okay, next one, x approaching 0. If I cover this side of the graph, what's my y value? What about this side of the graph? Were they the same? Yes. And it's 0. Okay, last one's kind of tricky, but it's not if you understand what the limit is. What is x approaching? Infinity. So look at your graph. As my x's continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger and I follow this line, are my y values approaching a specific number? No. So then what would you say about the limit? Does not exist. And I'm going to put because y values aren't approaching a specific number. Okay? What is that called at the end of the graph if the y value is going towards a certain number? Okay, yeah, but no, think like pre-cal. Asymptote, good. So this is the definition of an asymptote. We're going to get into that later. But if x is approaching infinity, you're looking at the ends of the graph to see, is it going towards a certain number? Or is it just doing whatever it wants? Okay? All right, turn the page. I would like for you to do row 1, row 3, and row 4. So the 1 row, the 7 row, and the 10 row. Pick a friend. Do them together. <laughs> Yeah, do that whole row. And make sure that's actually two. Oh, yeah. So you have to pay attention to where the negative is. That's weird.
Notice the pattern on these first rows. This is the left side only. This is the right side only. And this is definite, which means that they have to match. Yeah? So for my first one, two from the left, what are we approaching? One. What about from the right? Two. So what's the limit? Okay, good. Skip to row seven. We're doing negative three. Negative three is here. What is my left limit? What is my right limit? What's my overall limit? Okay, next one we're looking at is 6. 6 is here. If I cover up the right side and only look at the left side, what is my limit? Negative 2 is correct. What about if I cover up the left side and only look on the right? There's nothing there. It's D and E. But that was kind of tricky. Okay. My bad on that. Okay, and then next one, what about if x approaches 6? Does, Does not exist. Because if the two sides aren't the same, it doesn't exist. So if you don't have a side, how could they be the same? Yeah? Okay, let's go back to the second row that we skipped. Okay, 4. This is supposed to be an asymptote. Okay, so what that means is that your graph is going to approach that line from both sides, but it is not ever going to hit an actual number. So as I approach 4 from the left, is my graph approaching a specific number? No. What would you put? The any does not exist. What about if I approach from the right side? The any, which means the limit overall does not exist as well, the any. Okay, and then I'm just going to put because vertical asymptote is not approaching a specific number. Okay? So a vertical asymptote is not approaching a specific number. That means that your limits don't exist at those points. Okay, let's do negative 7. The first one is from which side for number 13 if there's a plus at the end? Okay, from the right side, do I have a limit as I approach negative 7? It would be 2. Okay, look at your graph. If I'm approaching negative 7, I'm only looking at this side. It looks like it should be 2. That is correct. What is my next limit? I'm going to put down here right side only. What would my left side be as I approach negative 7? I don't have a side. So then what's the next limit right here? does not exist as well. Okay, because if there's not a left side, it cannot equal the right side. Okay, last one. What is f of negative 7? 4. Four. Okay, so uh, this is like algebra 1, right? But f of negative 7, you are looking for the closed dot at x equals negative 7. So make sure that you understand. Don't forget everything you learned in Algebra 1. Open dots, you can have a limit. But a closed dot would be like f of negative 7. Okay, turn the page. 
All right, the next thing that we are going to talk about are scalar properties. For my physics -y people, what's a scalar? Um, scalar, okay. You can have them on vectors. Oh, it's magnitude, but not direction. Yeah, so it's basically like a coefficient. Like you're multiplying a vector by a number. So a scalar is just another number. Okay, here's the property. If you have the limit as x approaches c of k times f of x, you are allowed to take that constant k, that scalar, if you will, okay, and you're allowed to pull it outside of the limit find the limit, and then just times them at the end. So I would have k times the limit as x approaches c of f of x. So I'm going to take that 3 out on this next one. I'm going to take that 3 out of the limit. I'm just going to put it in the front. Okay, so look, I'm going to cross it out, and I'm going to put it there instead. So what is the limit? This is the same graph that we've been looking at. As x approaches negative 2 for graph f. Yes, 4. See right here? Right? It's at 4. And then what's 3 times 4? 12. Make sense? So it was 3 times 4, which was 12. Okay, next one. We're going to take our 5, cross it out, move it to the front. We're going to find the limit without the 5, and then we'll times at the end. As x approaches 1 for f of x. What are my y values approaching? Are they the same? No, look at 1. What happens, right? My left side was 1, but my right side was 3. That means the limit doesn't exist. So even if there's a constant in there, that's not going to fix the problem. Your left and right limits were different numbers, okay? Um, and then for my last one, oh, wait, hold on. Yeah, that was right. This one is going to end up having the same fate, huh? Yeah, that was x approaching 1. What's it going to be? Does not exist again. I think I meant to make that a g for the other graph, but oh well. Okay, next one, addition and subtraction. If you have the limit as x approaches c of f plus or minus g, That is the same as if you applied the limit to f and then add or subtract the limit of g. So instead of having both of them in the same limit, you're allowed to be like, okay, you get a limit and you get a limit and then we're going to add or subtract at the end. Okay? So look at that first one. As x approaches negative 2, look only at f. What was the value for f? 4, four plus. Then I see my 2 here. I'm going to leave that in the front, and I'm going to find what g is approaching. So now go back and look. g is this one over here. As x approaches negative 2, what is the height for function g? 1. Okay, PEMDAS here, we're going to multiply first. What's 2 times 1? 4 plus 2 is 6. Okay, give the second one a shot. This time x is approaching 1. Look at graph f. What happens at 1 for f? Okay, then the whole thing doesn't exist. Because f limit does not exist. So if either, that's like horrible notation, but you get the idea. If one of the limits doesn't work, the whole thing is messed up. Okay, go down to the next one. Product property, if you have the limit of f times g of x. Okay, based on the last property, take a guess. What can we probably do? Yeah, just find the two limits, give them each their own limit, and then multiply the answers together. So I'll have the limit of f multiplied by the limit of g. The limit of f multiplied by the limit of g. Okay, so we're doing x approaching 0. 
So I'd like for you to go up, when you're ready, look at the graph of F approaching zero, G approaching zero, multiply those numbers together, write it down, don't say it out loud. Then do the same thing for the next part as X is approaching one. So try those two. Okay, as F approaches zero, what's your Y value? What about G at zero? Negative three, multiply those together. Zero, very good. Okay, next one, F and G are multiplied, X is approaching one. What is the limit for F as X approaches one? Great. Okay, take a guess at your last quotient property. If you have the limit of F divided by G, what do you guess that you can do? separate them. Good. So you're going to do the limit of F and then you're going to divide by the limit of G. Oh, what did I do? So you'll just find both of your limits separately and then divide them. So try that next row. one of those next three should not exist. Or actually, yeah. I'm recording it for her, and I'm going to send her. I have to put it on YouTube. But, um, yeah, she told me she couldn't get up here because the elevator's messed up. Okay, X approaching negative 2. What is it for F? 4 divided by what was it for G? 4 divided by 1 is? Okay, next one. What was the limit for F as X approaches 0? Zero? 0 divided by what about for G? Zero divided by negative three is? Zero, but the next one's just upside down. Yes, if, undefined. Uh-huh. Now for a limit, what notation would you use? Does not exist. Does not exist. Okay, so what I want you to do right now is look at your homework. It looks kind of long, but it's gonna go by quick. I want you with whatever, whoever you want that you like around you, okay, to do everything on the front except for, oh, see? Long. Yeah, none of my clocks work. It's like a tragedy, honestly. Uh, it's 11.38, so you have what, like a while, 10 minutes? Yeah, you have like 10 minutes. Okay, and then flip over to the back. Don't scratch it out because we're going to do these tomorrow. We just didn't quite finish our notes. I'd also like for you to not do these ones with the stars. Okay? Wait, so we're doing... You should be able to do as much as you can get through, but at least the front, because we're going to check answers. Okay. So, very last one down here, and then the stars on the back. Everything else you should be able to do except for those four. Because um, it's F of G, and we just haven't covered that yet. You can take a guess, though. But that's our last property on here, the composite property. That's where you have a function and another function. So the tricky part about it, which is why I didn't want to get into it, is you only apply the limit to the middle, and then you plug that number in to the outside. So sometimes that that's why we kind of pause. Until when, like nine? Or what time do y'all get to eat? Oh, I thought you meant it's like a holiday where you have to fast a little bit. Is that not right now? Oh, we were talking about gum.
That's close though. That was really close.